Him. So I sent the link uh, to, to the page of Professor Rao, um, um, but um, I'm going to read this little bit. I mean, there are a lot of things there on the website, some awards that have been received. So, so he's a professor of population data science uh, at the University of, um, of uh, Liverpool, Department of Geography and Planning. Right? So his areas of expertise are in, uh, internal and international migration, human mobility, um, and geography data science. So um, he has been featured in many uh, databases, has worked with the United Nations, and has actually been quite kind to actually be here today. So I hope the weather was adequate, uh, the best we can offer. So anyway, so this is, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. It's really a pleasure. Uh, we met, I found out last night, longer than I thought ago, so probably like now three years ago, four years ago in Leeds, right? So, yeah. And, um, and he's been involved with the Alan Tony as well. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Ronaldo, for that introduction and inviting me here. Uh, so, and thank you, everyone, for making it to, to the talk in a Friday uh, afternoon. So, I know how to get people together to attend seminars. Uh, so, I really appreciate that. Uh, and hopefully, what I'm going to be presenting today is going to be of interest uh, for some people at least. Uh, and, I mean, I don't mind, you know, so you got questions uh, in the middle and you, you feel like interrupting and, you know, and asking questions, uh, so that, that should be okay. Uh, otherwise, you know, towards the end of the session, there should be enough time for, for questions. Um, so, good. So, the, the, so what I'm going to present today, so it's, uh, it's an idea that we've been developing for, for some time. So, and I thought when Ronaldo invited me, so I thought about presenting something very specific or presenting a bit more the different lines of work that we've been working on in relation to human mobility and migration. But then I decided that actually it would be a good idea, so in terms of the expertise uh, that we have in the room, so to talk a bit more specific about a specific project. Um, so and this, is, this is a project that uh, so is looking at how we can integrate data, uh, so in the context of transport. So and I'm going to elaborate that a bit more as, as we go on. So the specific piece of work that I'm going to present today, so it's a piece that is already published, so that got advantages in the sense that we got a paper out of that, so it's published in a good journal, uh, so it's, you know, so the, the method had been peer reviewed, but then, so probably you may have a few ideas on how that can be evolved, and I would be happy to hear those thoughts on, on how that can be taken forward. So and I got here a few a few people so that have been involved in the project uh, and and that is to say you know that's not been all my work uh, but there are some clever people here that have put a lot of work into this and also to say if you got any tricky questions that I can answer then so you got a few faces then that we can direct those questions to. Uh, so anyway so let me give you some sort of context. Uh, so the key idea here is that, so it's focused on transport, as you saw from the title. So and the key idea is that we want to know information about mode of transport. So we want to know the proportion of people that chooses to travel choosing different forms of transportation. So whether that is bus, taxi, active travel, and so on. Why is that important? Well, that is important because so we want to know about traffic on the road, so we want to know about where to put traffic lights, so kind of urban infrastructure to regulate traffic. We, we want to see where we, gonna, we can implement bike lanes, pathways, uh, so to increase and promote active travel. And essentially, essentially, this is all thinking on the idea we want to transition to uh, net zero carbon sort of urban environment, uh, so how we can facilitate that. So and having information on mode of travel is, is quite relevant uh, to look at all of these different things. The problem is that so we, we want to have this information in, in near real time or, or you know, so today, uh, not looking and thinking on two, three, three years ago, right? So it's kind of today and moving forward. And when you start looking into the data available, so that is one of the limitations, that most of the data are historical data, and, and normally, you know, a few years out of date. So 
then there is a there is a lack of you know up to date data uh, that we can use to to look at travel behavior. So how we normally tend to do and look at transportation data, in particular uh, mode of travel data. So we have travel surveys where people right, collect data. So HANA survey, and you get description on the demographics of people, the different choices they have in terms of transport. You get people also standing on the roads, counting cars, passing by cycles, and trying to get a count of people in those cars. And then you got the census, which is the, probably the more comprehensive in terms of geographical coverage, but it's done normally every 10 years, right? So then there is a, there is a cause of, the, of this, all of these methods, so they are expensive, tend to be infrequent. So as I said, the census is every 10 years. Uh, so travel surveys, in the best cases, is every year. The problem being, though, is that they, they still are out of date once they are published. So they are collected, but it takes a number of months or even years to actually release the information. So if you think about the census, for example, here in the UK, so it was collected 2021, 2020. Uh, so and just last week, so the data on travel to work was released at some sort of granularity. So then we still don't have, you know, those data at a high resolution, which means, you know, we can't really inform planning decisions based on current data sources. So that, that is one limitation. So and one, one advantage, though, that I should say here, uh, so is that although these data are expensive, infrequent, and so on, so they, got, they are rich in terms of collecting information about the population. So you got lots of ideas about the demographic, socioeconomics of the population, so you can get a, you know, an idea of how the age structure, occupation, industry sectors of the population. So in that sense, you know, we got a, so, some rich data sources here. So now, there are all these new forms of data, so digital footprint data, that have increased in popularity, so and they got lots of many different applications. Uh, in terms of mobility, so one of the key sources of information has been mobile phone data. Why? Well, because mainly three things, right? So you have real-time information on people, where they are, on where they are moving to. You have high granularity. Geographical granularity, so in terms of the point location detail, but also temporally, so you get information in real time, right? or potentially in real time. Uh, and then they are more cost effective because so they are collected, so and you don't really have to invest anything as long as you have you know a good partnership where you can get access to the data, you can potentially get this data at a very low cost. Um, so. One of the problems is that you don't have information on the population, right? So normally what you get is a column in your data set that will have information about the device, so an ID device. You have a timestamp, X and Y. And that's it. From there you need to create some sort of data set that is going to give you information about location. Uh, and flows of people traveling between different units for the urban system that you want to look at. Uh, so then any population attributes are, are missing there. So and, and then there is a challenge there integrating those aspects <coughs> that you can get from traditional data sources. So what we are proposing here in this particular paper is develop this uh, data fusion approach where you can get information that's useful from traditional data sources, like the so estimates of mode of transport, so the split of mode of transport, so the proportion of people traveling by bus, by um, mass transportation, and so on. But then use that and use new forms of data, particularly in this case we're proposing the, the use of mobility uh, mobile phone data, to update 
that information. So then how you can, using real-time or near real-time information from mobile phone data, how we can start providing updated estimates of motor travel. Okay, so that, that is the kind of the premise of this. Um, so and that is trying to kind of address the gaps in terms of, so you think about what I was saying before, travel surveys, so you go travel surveys every years or every two years, every three years. So then he's thinking how you fill the gaps. Right? So how you develop estimates that can fill those gaps. So give you estimates every month. Uh, but also, it's looking at the geographical granularity of the data. Because normally surveys, they are going to give you representation at the national level or at that regional level, for example, here in the UK. So you get regions. But then if you want to do anything looking at local area districts or even lower than that, so then you would struggle because you wouldn't have those data. So then this approach is also thinking on how we can actually start thinking about developing estimates at that lower resolution level, which is probably more relevant for planning purposes for the, for the things that we want to do, well, or decision makers want to do. So then the key idea is that so we are going to develop an initial estimate. Uh, so based on the traditional data sources we have available. And then we are going to add information from mobile phone data to update those estimates to a more recent time. And then we do some validation of that, uh, so to validate our, our approach. So that's what the presentation covers. And for this, uh, so we focus on a specific setting, which is far away from the UK, so it's down south, almost falling from Latin America, so there is this narrow country, uh, Chile, that is uh, neighboring Argentina and Peru, Bolivia. Uh, so and specifically, we focus on the capital of Chile, uh, which concentrates about half of the population of Chile. Uh, and and we focus on that, well, for a practical reason, we got really good data to look at that, so mobility, mobile phone data for Santiago. Uh, and so there was also a project in collaboration with regional agencies in, in Santiago, so they really needed so to do something like this, so we engaged with them, so we had ex expert knowledge on their transportation system in Santiago. Uh, and, and that was the focus of the study. So this is to give you an idea of the distribution by income of, the, of Santiago. So darker color means so you got richer families or richer neighborhoods in those areas. And as you can see, there is this kind of cone in that direction where affluent families tend to live. And then you got these areas over here in the south where you have a concentration of deprivation. Uh, and that sort of a structure, so that cone that you see of wealthy neighborhoods, that is kind of replicable of the pattern that you may see in lots of cities in Latin America. So then that has some sort of extra quality potential in that sort of sense. Um, so, and then on the, on, the, on the right, what you have is the proportion of people using mass transportation. Darker color means greater usage, lighter color use, lower usage. So, and what you can see there, that there is some sort of correspondence to how affluent those neighborhoods are. So, people living in affluent neighborhoods tend to use less these modes of massive transportation. Yeah? So, less bus, less public transport in general. Which, which makes sense because of in, what you have in Chile is that, so all of the employment centers so, are on affluent neighborhoods. So people from more deprived neighborhoods, they need to travel a long way to get to those neighborhoods. And normally they do that using public transport. Okay, so and, and by looking at that, so what I want to tell you is that so there, is, there are some behavioral aspects that are associated with the use of different modes of transport, which is not new, but here is how you, you start seeing that reflected. So, and that tells us that whenever we want to do about model transport, so whatever estimates or updated of estimates we want to do, we really need to consider also 
the population living in those areas. Yeah? So that is going to be influenced by income, but also by other lifestyle choices that can be captured by age, gender, occupation, and so on. So the key, the key sort of idea is we want to integrate this data, right? So we get an estimate, an initial estimate using traditional data sources, surveys, essentially. And then we want to update those estimates using mobile phone data, mobility data, or mobility data extracted from mobile phone data. And it's a kind of very complicated sort of network that we try to put together here. Uh, the, the method that we use is this idea of call, uh, called matrix factorization, so using algebra essentially to work out the interaction between these different matrices. So each of those circles that you see there, so they are all different matrices capturing the proportional numbers between municipalities, areas, right? And what we call waypoints or population or migration. Uh, so there are different matrices of different dimensions, right? depending on the number of units that we're talking about. Right? So if we got mode of transport, so we're looking at four modes of transport. And, and then if you link that to municipality, we have um, within Santiago, it's about in 36 or so municipalities. So it will be a matrix of 36 uh, by four. Right? So and then similarly, you can work sort of, you can work out the, the dimensions of the different matrices. And, and essentially what we're trying to do, so the, the links between the different matrices, that, that is the product between the two. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to update this blue line that you see here, which is essentially the proportion of people using different mode of transport by municipality, so by area. Okay, so that, that bit is, is what we're trying to, to look for. To update. Um, and this, all of those matrices on, the, on that side, on the left side, are the ones that we are using mobility data um, to, to update those estimates. And all of the other ones are the ones that are coming from census data or from surveys. So you are counting like per person, per time, per distance? How do you imagine? Because I imagine a person can go sometimes by car, sometimes by bike. So how they would be representing this calculation? Yeah. So we we group that into four different um, four different modes of transport. So that what we call mass transit, which is the combination of buses, metro. Uh, we go taxis as an independent thing. Uh, and then we got motorized, which is public, uh, private transport. And then we got active transport, which would be walking or, or riding, riding bikes. Um, but like you, you count, a person will be represented in more than one or just one, like the most? Uh, we, look at the, we look at the proportion. Okay. Yeah, so it would be the proportion in an area, what is the proportion of people that travel mostly using one of those modes of transport. Okay, so for each person you get like the most, the winner get oh. the, 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 the most that I spend the most time on. Yeah, so the one that they would report on the survey, so what is the main mode of transport you use every day. So, yeah, and, and we're looking at this at the, the area level, right? Uh, so, getting a closer look to that, so... The boxes here on, on the top, so those are the, the data sets that we're using to capture the, ori the original data, so the original estimates. So and here we're looking at getting an estimate, an initial estimate in 2012, and then updating those estimates to 2020. Okay, so that is the... The, the, the idea in this particular application. So we're getting estimates from the survey travel, uh, so the travel survey, um, to get an initial estimate of 
the mode of transport, so how people travel, so the proportion of people that travel in different modes of transport at, in 2012. And then the idea that we are going to establish an initial sort of a split, so, and then we are going to use information from mobile phone data and other attributes that are going to come from a, from a survey that captures and is updated regularly to integrate data on population at a, a different point in time and uh, information about mobile phones or the mobility patterns in 2020 to update those estimates. Uh, and then we'll do some validation to look at how that actually, so the estimate, how the estimates that we get actually compared to data, comparable data that, that has been officially collected. Uh, so then there are three basic steps on this approach. So the first step is developing that initial guess estimate. So then, and these are the four modes of transport that we are considering. Now you can go on and disaggregate this. Yeah, so that can be done. So the approach is applicable <coughs> and can be dis disaggregated further, whether that is spatially or by mode of transport. But the survey that we had, so had these categories. So that's why we sort of were conditioned by that. <coughs> but then if you have better data, you can potentially disaggregate this further. So similarly, initially for this paper, we were working at the grid level. So we had a, a much granular disaggregation. But then one of the comments we got is, well, how you are going to compare that to existing data to validate your approach? So you need to consider you know, official statistics to do that. So then we had to go back and kind of develop the approach from the municipality uh, perspective. Uh, but, but again, you know, so it's applicable. So you got more detailed data that is officially reported, and you can validate that, so then uh, you could potentially do it. So anyway, so here the idea was, so for each of the modes of transport that we consider, so we, got, we know the proportion of people by municipality traveling by each of them. So we got that proportion. We know it from the survey. We can estimate it. But then, so what we don't know and what we're trying to get for each municipality is what is that proportion in 2020, right? So then we wanted to feed into the, into the algorithm. So our first initial starting point, then just start calibrating that. And then, so what we thought, well, a simple guess here, kind of educate the guess, was well, this is going to be updated according to whether there is a growth in population or a decrease in population numbers. Yeah, so if population changes, you should have a change in the proportion of people using different modes of transport. So we did that. But then, so there was all the information that we knew, and we wanted to integrate that. So and that information was, for example, looking at metro trips so metro would be the subway uh, or underground in Santiago. So we knew that it had, so numbers of trips by metro had declined 43% over that period of time. And, and we this thought that was- based, Sorry, this is based on population or, or, based, or the number decreased by 43? The, the number, the trips, number of trips. So we had access to the smart car data that people used to go on, on metro. Uh, so we were provided with those statistics. Uh, so because we were working, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, some of the regional agencies, so they had access to data to, to look at this. Uh, and they actually were the ones that brought that up and said, hey, you know, but there, is this, there has been this decrease. So it's something that we've been trying to actually change because we want more people to use Metro. You know, and it's 53%, which is quite a lot. You know, so what is happening? Uh, and some of that, you know, got, got explanations, so there was a, a lot of evasion of, you know, paying the fees. And, but anyway, so, but there was that decrease. Um, so we wanted to integrate that, so then we then got that product that you see on the, on the right. Uh, and we wanted to moderate that, by, so that's why we use the square root, um, which moderates a bit that decline. 
Uh, anyway, so then that means that we sort of calibrated a bit using expert opinion from, so we had a few focus groups and, and you know, experts felt that, you know, the estimates that we got then were kind of appropriate to what they thought. Uh, so that was the best that we can, could do uh, using all of that and using all the information that we knew. So we went for that initial estimate, and that was the kind of the starting point for the model. And then, so we wanted to update, right? So, uh, or help that initial estimation using more information, because as we know, so we need to know better what, what are the information about human mobility, information about the infrastructure, how the infrastructure has changed from 2012 to 2020, uh, and how the population also has changed there. So as I said earlier, right, so different populations may have different behaviors. We don't know how the population in each of those locations have changed over time, whether ha that has stayed the same, or the population has indeed changed, and how much. So then that is where we wanted to bring all of that information, that fusion, of information and update those initial estimates. So the first task was to use mobility data. As I mentioned before, so here there is a lot of data science that has to be applied to actually get something workable. So we got uh, access to data from Telefonica. So Telefonica is one of the major uh, providers in Chile, so they capture about 25% of the market. Um, so and we got access to what is called XDRs, which is a bit different to probably what you may be familiar with, which is CDRs. So CDRs only give you information on the calls. XDRs give you information on the messages and the downloads. So and that will give you the information about the download, the location, but also the location in terms of the antenna where people are connecting to, to send that information. Uh, and we got access to about 1.8 million uh, devices, uh, so the timestamp and the antenna that they were connecting to across the whole of Santiago. The down <coughs> download is just like the, the volume or the app that is downloading? Uh, no, just the just the volume, okay. uh, just the volume. Yeah, uh, the amount of data, yeah. and then so we focus only on a short window of time, uh, which is that window in March 9th to 13th, 2020, and we also so for that entire week we capture 19 trips, so 19 million trips. Uh, and from there, so we wanted to focus only on that window, at the peak hour in the morning. So uh, we just wanted to get that information uh, to start training this model. Uh, and, and again, that could be applied for different times of the days, and, and, and that would all depend on information. So whether you got it, that information, so then that can be expanded. Um, so anyway, so, I, so here the, the key idea was, right, so we got those devices, so now we know it to work out what is the route that people are following, and then you got the antennas, right, so and then you need to work out where people, what antennas people are connected to, and then align that to different modes of travel, so if there is a, if there is a metro, there is bus connections, and you know the, the speed that people are traveling. So then by looking at that, you can sort of work out and infer whether they are using, they are traveling by bus, they are traveling by, uh, by metro and so on. Um, so we did all of that and we created this, um, what we call waypoint matrix, which is essentially each device connected to different antennas in different points in time. Uh, and by using that, then we work out the speed of travel, the distance of travel, and infer so, uh, some of the, mo the modes of travel that we're looking at here. But then we also had information from Telefonica also on what is called the deep package inspection. 
And that is essentially, for each device, what you get is the web domain that people connect to using their applications and, and the tower that they are connecting to. So essentially, we could look at you know, whether Ronaldo was looking at Wikipedia uh, you know, at 5 p.m. Uh, from this location here. Uh, and from there, so then we started looking at what sort of website we could look and sort of infer whether people were using different modes of transport. So then we identify <coughs> Uber, Cabify, which is the local version of Uber in Chile. Then there is Waze that tends to be used for navigation in the local area. And, and Trans Santiago, which is the, 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 tra uh, the transport, public transport network uh, in, in Chile. So, and by looking at that, so we can get an idea of what sort of transport uh, usage different areas have. Um, uh, so we use that information also to create a, another matrix looking at the proportion of people using different applications and, and how that could be related to the mode of travel they use. We also included uh, the infrastructure. So we took data from OpenStreetMaps. We identify different types of uh, streets, and, and we sort of associated them. So uh, we use a, a Latin variable to identify different associations. So we associated, for example, cycleways and pedestrian streets to active travel modes, highways to motorized and taxi modes, and mass transit, so where we see uh, primary streets and rail and metro networks. So, and then from there, we also created a number of these different matrices, um, identifying all of these different road, road types by area. Taking all that information, mixing it together using matrix factorization, then we develop our estimates by area. So we run a hundred iterations of that algorithm starting from different, so randomizing the process. And so what you see here, these are the different municipalities uh, across Santiago. And each of the four plots, so they show the different modes of transport that we consider. And one of the things that we see here is that well, there is quite a lot of variation in terms of areas, the, the mode of transport they use. There is a, a small percentage of deviation from the mean or from the median, which tells us you know, that the model estimates are quite stable. And we interpret that in a positive way, in the sense that while well, the model is doing a good job, we're getting good estimates with a high margin of precision. Uh, you would tell me whether that is the wrong interpretation or not. Uh, but that's how we, we, we interpreted that. Um, and so we managed to produce then that combination of model transport for it by location. So if we map all of that, uh, so this is more or less how it looks. Uh, and you know, so this kind of it is, it's kind of uh, in line with what we could expect in general geographical patterns. So you look at mass transit, so I mentioned that earlier in the sense that, so when you have very affluent neighborhoods, so you will see uh, a, a much lower, well, we're looking here at the difference though, so this is the variation in the percentage, but less use of public transport. Uh, which is, is what we tend to use, and, and, and there is a, a smaller variation because it's that in those neighborhoods there wasn't a lot of shifting uh, of, of public from private to public travel, uh, so that sort of continues. But in general, so what we see is a drop in mass, tran in mass transit. Uh, we see an increase in motorized transit, and that sort of aligns with what happens during the pandemic. So if I can bring you back to 2020. So there was early days of the pandemic. So people were avoiding traveling on mass transit or public transit. So they were shifting more to private uh, vehicles. 
And then there was also a slight increase in taxi, um, taxi services, and that's because people wanted to be away and distant from other people. And then the thing that at the beginning we were a bit puzzled by that sort of decrease in active travel because so we had the, initially we had the opposite hypothesis that we would see an increase in active travel. But then people from the government, so they were telling us that at that time, so in Chile, so there was a strict COVID regulation, people couldn't move, so they, did, they didn't have the opportunity that we had here in the UK where you could go at least for once a day for an hour to do exercise or go, go to a park, etc. <coughs> so they had, they had to ask for permission formally to the government, so and they, can, they could have access only to two permits per month to go to the supermarket or do anything. So they, they were telling us, well, you know, so we would expect actually a greater reduction, if anything. Uh, so, and well, with that, we sort of uh, were happy with that explanation. Uh, but yeah, so overall, kind of the pattern uh, makes sense, but also represent the variability that you would expect within uh, municipalities across the region of Santiago. So uh, the last... The last bit of that was the validation process. And, and the validation is always tricky with these things, especially when you use digital footprint data. I don't know if you are familiar with that. But. So one of the issues that we usually tend to have here is you start using data from digital sources because you don't have data in the first place. You want to have outdated information because there isn't a source of data. So then there is nothing comparable that you can look at. So that, that is one sort of limitation, right? So then normally people try to make data representative by using post stratification methods, using data from censuses, and then they sort of defeat the purpose of using up-to-date data because they apply census data, which are, you know, five, ten years old, and they bring the population back to, you know, ten years uh, in time. Anyway, so that is... Uh, so then, we didn't have the same data. Uh, what we had access to was the, the use of smart card data by municipality. And we have our estimates that we're grouping. The smart card data, so that, that tends to, to be multipurpose in terms of that it's used on buses, it's used on metro. Uh, but it's not the only way how you can get on public transport. Yeah? So that, that is one of the limitations. But then we have the, 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 the mass transit trips, which is a slightly different. Yeah? So then when we look at this validation, we were thinking on having a broad a special pattern that looks the same, so a sort of positive correlation here. Yeah? We wouldn't expect it to have the same numbers because you know there is, they are not the same thing. Uh, so there wasn't an ex exact match in terms of numbers. So anyways, so all of that is to say, well, we look at this, we look at the correlation, it's positive, 0 0.8. We were happy, review we were happy, so then, you know, we, we got some uh, kind of quite uh, reasonable estimates there. And then finally, so second validation process that we wanted to apply was, okay, so we are selling this idea, well, you can update all of this data, uh, you can have, you know, survey data, use mobile phone data, update the estimates, and then you have, you know, new estimates are updated. But then we wanted to see how much value, actually, the data add to that estimation. Um, so, and we got two different things here. So this is what is called the reconstruction error. Uh, so there is a formula in the paper, so I'm gonna spare you the, the, the equation. Uh, but the idea is, is, is looking at that, uh, so the solution of the final model against our first estimate. So it's called error, but we don't see that as an error in this application because it's our guess estimate, the initial estimate compared to the final estimate. So you can interpret that in different ways. Uh, and then we look at the correlation between 
overestimates and the smart car data. So we're still looking here at the smart car data. So it's not all of the estimates that we generated, but only for mass transit. So, and we compared different models, the different iterations of the models. Uh, so, and we got the, the models where we have all of the data. We have models that didn't include the application usage, so the deep the, uh, uh, package in infection data, and the models that didn't include the mobile phone data. Uh, so, and then we compute the correlation between the smart card data, the mass transit data, and we look at the error. So, and we, and we plotted all of those here for all the different iterations of the model. And essentially what this is telling you is that there is a tension on what criteria you are going to use to decide for the model what the best model is. So you look at only the correlation. So you see here high correlation because that, that is the best model. But that is also the model that gives you the greater error or a greater error if you compare that with a model including only, in, no including uh, mobile phone data. Yeah? So if you don't include mobile phone data, you're going you're gonna to have a smaller error, but also a lower correlation. Right? So then that raises the question of what, you know, is the criteria, what you're trying to maximize or minimize here. Uh, and, and, you know, so that, that is what we... I argue, you know, so it's, it's, it's for discussion, you know, so it depends on the application that you want to include here. Um, but because we wanted to have estimates, updated estimates, so then um, we went for the for, for all of the data model. Um, so a few conclusions. Um, so then we propose that this is a novel approach to produce estimates, so uh, modus transport, uh, where you can have multiple modes, so normally you look at the literature, so they will give you, they will focus on one type of transport, so to produce estimates. And we also were able to identify bikes and different ride hailing trips um, through the use of different applications, connection to different websites, which is not information that is not available uh, officially. And, and then we raise the challenge of how do you select the best model? Uh, so, as I said, you know, depending on what you want to do, you may have different purposes, you may need different criteria. And that's it. Thank you. We have time for questions, if anybody has a question, if you start. Yep. Uh, in your model validation, did you see any patterns in which parts of the city the model was more accurate in? Did it correspond with affluence or general travel patterns? Yeah, so, I mean, here you can see that there are, there are specific places. Uh, there wasn't, there are specific places for which the model is not, you know, less precise, I would say, or there is more variation, more variability. Um, the, it wasn't consistent, as you can see, so different areas appear in different modes of transport, so different estimates. So, uh, in some cases, we could explain that. So here, for example, this place is uh, very has very low density. It's on the outskirts of the city. Uh, so it makes sense that motorized transport is probably the only way of traveling. Uh, uh, and we thought that that would be the you know a, an easy way for the model to produce that. But then, by including information on mo mobile phone data adds noise to that estimation because there aren't many towers on that location. Uh, uh, but, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't clear in all cases, you know, why they got, you know, such a high uh, margin error. Um, so, yeah, so we didn't look specifically at trying to explain that, but, but we look into it. Uh. So, 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 uh, okay. um, I have a good question. So, about the general, generalizability of this, right? So, first, suppose that you approach by a city, say, Paramaribo or something, Suriname, and 
So what, what things do you need? Because, for instance, there are a lot of informal transportation in some cities that, as you know, in South America or Africa, that you won't be able to identify, for instance, that is Uber because it's basically someone passing by and you wave. I mean, you still have the data from the mobile phone, but you don't know the website that is being accessed. Right. So, I mean, what exactly do you, I mean, what is it necessary and absolutely needs to exist for you to actually be able to do this? Yeah, so I would say, so you need an initial idea of, you know, historical data, at least how people in the past, so the proportion of people that use different modes of transport, um, some sort of estimate, you know, initial estimate that you can start, you know, working from. Um, so that, that would be a necessary bit of data, and I would say, so, some sort of location data. It doesn't necessarily need to be mobile phone data, but location data. So, social media networks or, you know, all the type of location data. Um, that is to, that is exactly to capture some of the ideas that you mentioned there. Um, so, you got informal transport or, you know, ways of moving people. So then that is not going to be captured, as you said, by looking at a website or by formal means uh, of statistics or administrative procedures. But you can still get an insight by using location data. You know, you know, the mass of people are moving from A to B, right? So then location data would be the other uh, necessary element here. And then, you know, so th those could be the two, I would say, you know, kind of essential to at least produce something reasonable. And then if you want to improve that, I would say, you know, so you need, uh, you need to know what sort of population lives in what sort of places. Um, so have a, you know, idea of the distribution by demographics, by socioeconomics, um, just start adding value to that. But yeah, so location data, a mode of transport data, I think those are the two components that you would need. I have another question. Anybody have any? I have one. So do you have any kind of filtering in your data? Because I imagine that some areas of the city, you have fewer towers, so you are covering larger distance, and you don't have, you don't, actually you can't estimate how far, how fast you are traveling, because you are in, in the same, so you don't know if it's... Uh, cycling or walking or whatever. Mm. So, is there a way that you can focus like on trajectories that occur between like borders, or is there any, any any sort of filtering in the data in order to remove this kind of uncertainty from the data? Uh, not sure if I understand correctly the question. Uh, we we have data on we know the location of the towers, so we we map that out. So it's, it's on the paper um, where we. We look at the density of the towers in Santiago. Uh, so, and yeah, so the distribution is not equal across the city. Uh, so there is concentration in the center of the city, in the most affluent areas. And then in other places, you still got good coverage. So it's not the same as in the center of the city or the more affluent areas, but you still got coverage. So I think you, you still have you know, precision, at least, you know, more than three or four antennas within a municipality. I think way beyond that. Uh, so probably 10, actually, antennas within a single municipality. So you still can get a sense, but it's, it's yeah, still no, also just, a limitation yeah, have a, in terms so of... What, what, what would be the biggest area that one antenna will, would cover? Uh, well, it's... it's I don't remember the, I don't have in the top of my head the, you know, the, the actual, you know, geographical area that I would cover, but it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty small oh, area. Okay. Uh, so, you, I mean, so, if you have the time, you know, and look at that map, so it's, it's quite dense. So you can see that some points kind of in the map, they look overlap uh, with each other. So it's, it's very, very tight. Yeah. So, another question? Yeah, yeah. So if, so that's all right. Yeah, just to follow on from that from that question. So we, um, yeah, I'm involved in a project where we're looking actually at something similar to this. So thank you for the talk. It's been really really good. Um, and 
Yeah, one of the things it it does tend to underrepresent the mobile phone data underrepresents these short journeys, which I think is what you were kind of getting at. Is, is that right? So if you have journeys within a cell tower, obviously you're not you know not between cell towers. You're gonna that's not going to be represented in your data. Um, and I, I guess the other thing that might happen is that the is that short journeys that go across the cell tower they could be very short, but they could be across two towers mm -hmm. are going to be recorded. But you know there might be longer journeys within a single cell tower. It, are those sorts of Bias is important for your study, or do you think it all kind of evens out once you get the, the mm. once you look at the distributions across the um, across the municipality? The honest, the honest question is, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I could. Yeah, I mean, so you're right. So I think there would be an underrepresentation of those short trips. Uh, you wouldn't capture that, and I guess that is why, you know, the precision of this. Uh, CDRs or XDRs data, so that, that is the limitation they got, uh, because essentially you are, you don't have the point location, right? So that there could be that idea that you're moving around a tower, uh, so you're still moving, but still there. Um, so, and, and where you probably need GPS data uh, to capture that. Uh, we didn't look at, we didn't look at that, uh, but yeah, so, and I'm wondering now how you would actually look at that. So the influence of, of those short trips not being captured, how that would impact the estimate. Yeah, I would need to think about that. I, 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 don't know. I, I wondered whether the, the signal strength is something that, that you could get from, or that they, yeah. they, maybe they record that, I don't know, the mobile phone companies, in which case, obviously it wouldn't help if you're going around a tower, as you said, but if you're moving further away from a tower, mm. that would be a way of increasing the granularity, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. I don't know if it's recorded. Yeah, it, there, it, there is information on that. Yeah. No. Okay. okay. And yeah, I guess the only thing is sometimes that the precision also is different uh, across across towers uh, and across device, uh, depending how. I guess that represents also the signal. I, I, I imagine. Uh, so you move away, so it's less precise because the signal is weak. Uh, yeah, but I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't have the answer for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like, <clears throat> the fake trips you mentioned that I'm very close to a region that's covered by two two different antennas. I'm not moving at all, but my signal is jumping there, and it looks like I'm traveling a lot. Like I don't know how often that would appear in your data. I, I don't think that happens very often, because the antennas, at least in Santiago, so they... They are locating in such a way that they optimize the space of coverage. So they are pointing. So if they are together, they are pointing to different directions. So they don't cover the same area. Uh, I guess there could be, you know, an our area where, you know, you have that problem. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's. I mean, I'm not giving any any evidence for it, uh, but I think it's less of a problem. Uh, but, you know, you can believe me on that one. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it's interesting, I mean, I'll be curious, of course, there's always questions about the data, right, because, I mean, I don't know the one that you have, but this kind of data sometimes, so for instance, if I, in certain countries, if I have two phones registered on my name, two lines, then, and I wonder how you deal with this, because I'm going to appear twice, right, because the name that is listed is, because this is generally for billing purposes, mm -hmm. so which means that I can be here on the other side of the city, for instance, if my partner is there. Right, so uh, I've seen I've seen cases that people actually clean the data to only accounts that have only one uh, number, and I wonder if you've done that, because even if you did, how are you going to deal with the fact that you are two places at the same time? Well, we got the we so the data that we're provided with, so we got a device ID, so it's by device, so it wouldn't be by person, by individual. Uh, so there is no way to know that. Also, oh, you have by device. Good. So a lot of times it's by account number, and then if you have um, two lines in your account, that account appears because it's for yeah. billing. Then yeah, no, right. we got the so the data that we're given. So that is, I guess, the anonymization mm -hmm. of the data. So we get by device. So it's it's possible that. You know, there are, they, there are devices that are under the same account, but we wouldn't know that. And I guess my, my last question is about your, your model, I mean, the, the, the quality of the models, right? You have there, what's the best model? But it seems to me that the correlation, the var variation there is not, I mean, 
that is one that is a better correlation. But is that significant? Because the areas seem to be quite significant change, but you move from point eight to point eight nine or something. Is that um, right? I mean, when you go, or maybe I see, you know, yeah, first you have yeah. what you call the, I mean, no mobile phone is point eight three. Yeah. And the other one. So like, I think that's a good point, uh, and you know this. This was was one of the funny, um, the funny discussions we had with the with the reviewers um, <coughs> because there was this point of initially we had this granular model uh, that was looking at grids uh, where we couldn't validate uh, validate the model but the error was a lot lower uh, and then. They were telling us, well, you know, how can we trust it? We don't have any way to validate this. Um, so you need to go higher up. And that's why we, just, we ended up using municipalities, which wasn't my preference because you are kind of def defeating one of the advantages of having granular data. But that was to please one of the comments that was, well, you need to validate that. And then we ended up with actually when you use municipality level data, you end up with a greater error uh, for, for that model over there. Um, so, uh, and the, these results kind of flip in a sense, uh, because so you get that this, so the no mobile phone, with mobile phone data, you get a better estimate, uh, lower error, um, and, and it's, you have this the other way around, right? Um, so that, that was one of the one of the things. Um, yeah, and here, yeah. So we need to work quite a lot in the interpretation uh, and in the discussion for uh, for pleasing that comment, uh, which I mean, it's, it's a shame because I think the the results looking at granular data were were better, anyways. Uh, it's always the review number two. So exactly. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Just, just on the same sort of point. Um, so your sort of preto front, I guess, would, would be those those triangles all the way, you know, going across down to the bottom right-hand corner. Yeah. yeah. So, wh are those models? What what was the, what why did you, why was the red triangle chosen as the best well, one? Right? Yeah. So that, that, as <laughs> I said, you know, that was based on on this idea. But essentially, that was the the color one is yeah. the model with the smaller with the smallest error. So it was based on looking at this. Yeah. Okay. And that's why we're saying, yeah. well, actually, if you look at the correlation and try to look at the triangulation of the two, the results will be different. So you, you are, we would end up with a different, probably a different choice of model. Um, yeah. And those, those, the other, the gray ones, they're variations of that? Yeah, so this model. is the same, same model, but different random iteration of the model. Uh, okay. Yeah, so... So not parameterization that... Yeah, so you have, you know, that may be a, even a better model, I don't know. So it's, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm conscious of time because our speaker has to catch a train. So I'd like to thank Francisco again. Thank you for being here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.